nature. And then um, we should be taking Karaka. So uh, this is English. Uh, I hope that's all right. You must have noticed that this writing, this writing, I don't know, some, some of you must have read wrongly that please go. And this writing is actually a spoof, spoof in that book. The title of the book is Politics, Women and Well-being. The title of this lecture is Family, Women and Well-being. So in a sense, uh, um, Robin Devery was presenting a very well-known formula um, quite central to the Kerala model discourse, which is like if I put it formula it which is politics plus women is equal to well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so um, in a sense, that is very central to the Kerala model understanding that the family is not just a democratizing, socialistic, social democratic politics that we need. Uh, but women, you know, in a sense, women are central, and the hidden term there is actually family. Hmm? But anyway, so I'm trying to pull that veil, veil off that, that kind of discourse. So, but why study family now? Because I can tell you why. Because because the 1990s, 90s at least, we have been seeing a certain heightened um, anxiety about the fate of the Malayali family. In the 1990s, you know, people were talking about how globalization and rising consumerism and rising individualism, where well, all of this was affecting uh, the Malayali family values, Malayali family values. And this is indeed a count of family referred to is, of course, the heterosexual extended nuclear family or the standalone nuclear family, and assumed to be the primary source of affective connection and empathetic values. So the whole idea is that if the family collapses, there will be no more an empathy in society. There will be no more sources of affection. Hmm? It is also valued as a primary disciplinary institution, uh, both shaping and sheltering modern subjects. So the fundamentals, you know, fundamentally, it is supposed to produce disciplined, hardworking, uh, industrious subjects. For um, you know, the, uh, for society, for modern society, it is also assumed to be the essential source of welfare for the individual. In the sense that, if you are in trouble, if you are unwell or in need of some support, the primary source of that support should come from the family. So, the destruction of the family would mean the destruction of that kind of support as well. So, you know, so therefore, we have statistics now that show that. Well, uh, even family and the side, but marriage definitely seems to be in crisis in Kerala. The rising, the rising number of divorces since the 1990 reports of domestic violence have definitely risen after the domestic violence legislation. Uh, all of this is uh, regarded with worry by both the state as well as patriarchal authorities. Uh, we know that the centrality of marriage to women's uh, social ambition. It's still very strong in Kerala, especially among the low middle class uh, and, the, and the underprivileged groups. Uh, and except for a very small segment of highly educated women who are now able to resist the pleasure to get married a little more, the rest of us are all here, clearly, uh, you know, uh, facing the prospect of being denied social conditions if we do not get married. And that's the, that's the situation. Uh, of very low employment prospects for women in Kerala, exactly. Why, why do you have to get married? Essentially, partly because there is no guarantee that you will get a job in women particularly if you pass out of uh, higher education. So, state feminism, if you look at it, state feminism in Kerala since the 1970s, which you will find in a whole bunch of women's empowerment initiated by the government of Kerala since the 1990s, even these have not touched the centrality of marriage and family for women. Our welfare system continues to offer what is called uh, marriage assistance to the daughters of, of poorer families to what is called Mangalya Patani. Almost every department has a Mangalya Patani going on. Uh, the fears of the decline of the family because women are uh, getting uninterested in marriage, however, are now starting to get, be getting focused. I heard about something, this was a big talk 
It's a big discussion on social media some time back. I don't know, I, no, I can't vouch for the quality of that research. But some research happened we interviewed a whole bunch of young educated women who were in colleges and all of them told him that they are not interested in math. They would resist it. So we portrayed it as a huge crisis um, and we immediately appealed to various patriarchal authorities you know, that they should come and meet out. And we know that it only shows how the anxiety, the continuing anxiety about the family in the presence. And of course, the critical feminist presence in Kerala has also left this anxiety pretty much unimpaired. Yet there is good reason to get past the ideological complex secreted by the different segments of civil society and state agencies that establish the inevitability or necessity of the family. We need to ask questions about the structural role that the family plays in contemporary Kerala, not only in terms of reproducing gender inequalities, but also economic inequalities in the state. You know that we are living in a time when the mini coefficient is actually literally going through the roof. You know? The inequality of weight are stratospheric in, in contemporary Kerala, the rates at which it is increasing. So what role does the family play in that? Uh, what are what effects does it, does it have on social life in Kerala? These are critical questions that we need to ask as a way of getting past these cop the ideological cockpits which kind of really us at every turn. Especially young women are waylaid at every turn. I'm sure you've been to none of you have missed uh, the thing of going to a marriage and being questioned about oh when are you getting married? Why are you not getting married? etc. Et I'm sure all of you must have faced it at one point or the other. Oh you don't worry, you face it soon enough. Happened yet. The dowry marriage in Kerala, as you know, is ubiquitous and highly disempowering, especially in the context of high female unemployment. Uh, very high levels of domestic violence and, and worse, the endorsement of domestic violence, as evident in the National Family Health Surveys, is uh, rampant in Kerala. Then, children, uh, for example, if you then you turn around and say, okay, all this is terrible, but the more families offer safety for children. Now, there is an alarming amount of evidence that shows that families may not be very safe for children. Because if you're thinking about sexual violence, I mean, sexual violence seems to be more and more reported from families, not outside families. Yeah, but then, interestingly, we always think, we, uh, you know, if you look at the cases where sexual violence against children have been discussed, they mostly about outsiders entering the family or kidnapping the child or doing something to the child. It's only very rarely that we hear about cases and we discuss with a lot of public outrage when it happens in the family. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, and more importantly, why sexual harassment of children is, uh, sexual abuse of children is really somehow touches all of us. The terrible kinds of beatings and other kinds of corporeal punishment and psychological repression of children. In, in, and remember, this is a highly, this is a society where we are rapidly individuating. Now, a child now who is around eight years old is probably more individuated than an adult or than a, than a 19 year old was 10 years back. So, remember, this kind of repression, repressive teaching, etc., are happening against that kind of a child. So the consequences are even more worse. So um, the, we don't really pay much attention to that kind of child abuse. We are very interested, we are very worried about sexual abuse. So then there's enough research that shows that women enjoy very little power in marriage, even when employed. So if you look at the research on uh, women who seeking maintenance or divorce in family courts, there is ample evidence that show that uh, women uh, suffer from an immense amount of asset loss. Loss of assets, not just uh, income, disposable income, but actually assets at marriage and, and at divorce. And, and interestingly, unlike in places like the US, women have no claim to property acquired after marriage. Here. You can only ask for maintenance. In the US and in many other places, if you are to file for divorce, the family property is revised exactly now. Here you can't claim that, you can only claim maintenance. 
Meanwhile, the responsibility of her family life continues to fall very, very heavily on women. I have a whole book now, which will be out hopefully at the end of the year, on, uh, on this, on looking at low middle class and underprivileged families and the, what the increasing burden of social reproduction on uh, women of these groups is doing to them. So, uh, and so, and, uh, well, I, I won't carry on about that because it's, it's, it's a maybe it's a question uh, yeah. among people. If you have questions, I can I can address it then. Now, you can critical scholarship on inheritance in the and marriage and family in the 20th century Kerala. Actually, there is it's not a, such a big theme. There is some uh, amount of research, and much of it is historical and feminist. So you have the work of people like Charles Amani, G. Arunima, Pravina Kolo, among the my among my contemporaries, <coughs> among my contemporaries. And you have uh, younger scholars like Sonia Thomas, um, whose work on civilization is very interesting, and, and others. And a more recent sociological and anthropological research on childhood youth in Kerala, it also throws a lot of light on uh, the, uh, the shaping of the family in 20th century Kerala. Now, these have exposed the contradictions of what is the so called Nagotan as a term I find extremely inaccurate and, and deeply ideological. Uh, how one thing continues, think of it as liberating in some unqualified sense uh, only if one turns a blind eye to the new forms of power that it engenders, especially in the institutions of the modern family and the modern caste community. Yet these critics seem to have these feminist, historical, anthropological, social academic critics of the family seem to have had no impact. Uh, and on welfare policies, particularly in Kerala, uh, both the Malayali left as well as the right seem to have embraced the family of right. And that's not surprising because we know, for I mean, we know that in the 20th century we did not really have socialism in Kerala, we had social democracy. And uh, that is why people, social democrats like Robin Delphi, were so interested in, in Kerala. You know, many of the, the left people who study Kerala are not really communists. They are mostly social democrats. And it's not surprising because we know by now that of the centrality granted to the heteropatriarchal family in social democratic theory. So if you read the works of people like Karl Polyani, I think you must really encourage students to read Polyani. So if you read Polyani, it's very clear that the conservatively defined family, community, and land um, put in a bulwark against an accelerating capitalism. And this was characteristic of communist slash social democratic thinking in Kerala too in the 20th century. And not surprising then that the literature on the Kerala model achievements has rarely raised a critique of the family in Kerala and indeed continues to place much hope on the heteropatriarchal family as the heart of the beating heart of state and family in Kerala. So, you have to, so this is uh, this is where uh, our um, you know um, trans people find themselves at a crisis. Unless you are able to claim family status, membership in a family, it's very difficult for you to claim that. And even if you do claim, there is always the social stigma of someone who is claiming that without deserving it. Because you don't have babies to take care of, or old people to take care of. Not surprising, uh, again, is the fact that it was never questioned in the 1990s when social democracy in Kerala moved slightly towards neoliberalism, neoliberal government family. Once again, it became very center, the beating heart of neoliberal welfareism in Kerala, and that's why you have the name Kudukashti. Kudukashti hmm. is very much there, the heart of it. Uh, and, in, um, and so, in, in, even feminist activism in Kerala will not risk being the bad name of being a Kudukam directly. <laughs> so, in fact, in our book, our forthcoming book, the title of the lecture is a forthcoming, the book of a forthcoming book which I co-wrote with, um, with Anamika Ajay, who is also a, a, a social researcher uh, from, uh, in Kerala, about Kerala. 
Uh, we call it a Kudumba Kalaki Kriti of Himalayas. That's what is appropriate with that term. I think in Kudumba Kalaki is not at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not following the bit. And we can discuss that during the question. And so I am here trying to strip off the quasi natural benign aura that continues to highlight and protect the idealized Mayadi family that conceals both its shaping by different rationalities of power in the 20th century. So that's a history that has not been explored. And also the violence. So when you're talking about that family as a natural history, as a benign history, somehow all its sins are forgiven. You will not forgive them such a sin if it happens in a public institution. Right? So if you get beaten up in the school of social science, you will be really like it. If you get beaten up at home, you try and kind of many of us go on to talk about it. So Malayali feminist historians have exposed new relations of marriage and family that led to women's disempowerment and domestic confinement, particularly the importance of dowry and its impact on female inheritance. But they have not well explained well enough the persistence, the implicit persistence of the possibility of violence against women in the family. It's not as if it is not there. Fact, violence is actually happening against women in every family. But somehow, women are, well, we all kind of implicitly accept that women are more likely to get it. Or women are, and if women get beaten, well, it's a bad thing. But something we really kind of really suspect. Okay, you know, we can't put a finger on it still. You know, how we how we justify that. So that is to say, if the modern woman whose innate capacity, now this is the ideal of modern woman that came up in the early 20th century, which I spent eight whole years in School of Social Sciences trying to clarify. Uh, the uh, modern woman whose innate capacities are well developed through education and socialization is now uh, viewed as a full-fledged agent of domestic power, shaping subjects and managing materials and guarding souls in the modern family. I mean, that is a promise that was offered to women in the early 20th century in within the discourses of social reform. So now, if that is the case, how come there is so much tolerance of domestic violence, especially by the husband and his family supports her? If the woman who enjoys so much power in the family as a guardian of souls and manager of materials and shaping subjects, who made a big disciplinary and gentle disciplinary in the family, she is so important to the family, how come she can be still be? And everybody tells you not to see even big reformers tell you to keep quiet as much as possible. Speak about and I'm telling even I mean I know uh, again nobody wants to be put on the palette. You will really know that the woman is the Blue. Now, existing feminist scholarship, including my scholarship, including mine, which I carried, the research that I carried out in the School of Social Science, does not explain this, does not give you much insight into this. I think for this, we need a Foucaultian history of the present, which is a kind of historical inquiry that picks up a puzzle of problems of the present. And then tries to trace the history of the displacement, the repurposing, the conflicts, the struggles, and all of that, which led to shape these problems. And I think it would reveal the complexity and finer detail of the intertwining of multiple forces and institutions that gave rise, which is of course the beginning of an understanding. So if you want to tackle a puzzle, a problem, then you need to know what it where, where all it comes from, what are its sources and how those sources have tangled, what tangled up with each other, then you can untangle and you know, point to some kind of solution on the other. Now, Foucault's own insights into the nature of the family as a part of an institution are crucial here. In fact, he tends to view the family as a seat of sovereign, not disciplinary power. So this is interesting. He has argued that disciplinary power was drafted onto the family, and in the famous 1973 lecture on sovereign power, he argued that the family preserves the essential 
these are from sovereignty. That is domination, membership, uh, bonds of sovereignty, bonds of suzerainty, blood, blood ties, etc. Uh, so it may well be the case uh, in what the modern Malayali family also. Now, secondly, existing family scholarship rarely deals with the coming of the modern family among the assentless and socially oppressed sections of the Malayali. Now, this is a great failure in my early work. You know? And part of the reason was at that point we had a rather superficial kind of idea that um, it is not appropriate for um, uh, scholars with um, privileged caste, oppressive caste origins to um, explore uh, the histories of those who belong to the oppressed communities. It was not considered appropriate. Now, that was a, a point is yes, uh, <laughs> the only thing was that the oppressive caste origin scholar should not try to speak for that's, that's the, It's a different thing to explore the structure of past that actually shape the institutions among modern institutions, among oppressed communities. That's one thing. It's another thing to speak for them. So at that point, as a young scholar, I, not only did I, uh, I mean, I would have, I, I would have been, I mean, I'm sure uh, Dr. Nizaraman would have grown in despite if I said that, because my dissertation is already like nearly crossing 400 pages. So he would have, he, I mean, he cut out a chapter, no, two, two chapters, of, of one actually a written chapter and one uh, imagined chapter, both were cut out, because he just thought that the examiners are going to collapse reading all this. Uh, but uh, so, but then I think that was a way, you know, and we well, should have done that. Or at least I did fly it in my conclusion as a failing, uh, which I hope some other person would take up and put it. So that's all I could do at that point, and I'm trying to make up for that. And the sad, I must also say that I'm really sad that how many years I, I submitted my dissertation here in 1998, I became book in 2007. But I am sorry that that gap remains largely unfulfilled after all these years. My hope was some that young people will come up and do it. Uh, but I hope you and your generation will take up that challenge. So anyway, I want for the rest of this lecture to present a, an, a, an account of the shifting rationalities of power in, um, in Malayalam speaking regions in the 19th and 20th centuries the imagination of the modern Malayali family and this actualization, how that actualization is related in these new rationalities and how they really both came out. But as far as uh, the oppressed class, uh, working class family is concerned, the uh, wonderful um, um, exception to what I just told you is the work of course of Anna Nicole. So her, I mean, my understanding of Brahminic patriarchy in modern Kerala derives from her description of the process of hegemonization uh, of the millennium woman worker. But that's another lecture. I mean, I have I can speak about Brahminic patriarchy in 21st century Kerala, but lecture and another chapter in my book. So I will not touch on that unless you have questions. So my claim, briefly put, is that the historical trajectories of uh, the new age, uh, that is the, the communities that actually benefited hugely from the social transformation of the 20th century. I call them the new age communities. So I believe that the families in the new age community and uh, uh, the experience of women in them were radically different from the experience of women in non-elite Malayali families in the fourth of the 20th century. And this is this might look like a self-evident claim until you actually start probing into the consequences of it. It's not a simple claim. Yeah, if, it's, if, you, if you just remain at the superficial level, you think self-evident and what more? What more is going to be challenged there? You know, to prove that I'm not hoping to give you some idea of uh, what might be at stake in improving this uh, So um, I believe that these uh, forms of families have been informed very differently by sovereign and disciplinary and governmental powers, all three kinds of power that people describe. So to start, let's start with 
very briefly referring to the transformation of political power in mid 19th century in most of the Malayalam speaking regions. You know that most of these regions came under British domination. All these regions actually came under British domination in the 19th century. So, uh, with the consolidation of British power, um, you know, it, it, here of course political power was very different in the pre British times. Like uh, Sudhita Pavaraj and others point out, you have a caste practice disciplinary social conduct without a frequent direct recourse to sustain power. And political power was kind of distributed in layers of authority. It did not rest in a, an absolutist state, unlike in the West. So once the British authority was established in Kerala, in other parts of India, in many other parts of India, there was some effort to set up replicas of European states or because of this social and political peculiarity pre-existing in Kerala. So the colonial state could not be absolutist by any chance. Rather, it claimed that it would not be responsible for everything in a vast and complex society. So aspects of social conduct which did not affect the state were gradually called tradition uh, and protected from reform. So uh, this allowed Indians to claim social autonomy from political colonialism. So it seemed that the Indian caste elite could continue to exercise a sphere of subsidiary quasi-sovereignty uh, uh, over society while political sovereignty was to rest entirely with the British. Now if you want to see an example for that for this, you only have to look at 19th century travel code. Now you know that a modern, modern tribal court, the king of tribal what did Bhattandar Orma do? He essentially engaged an extremely modern maneuver by conquering the principalities around him, though concentrating power in the monarchy of tribal court, but in a very smart, modern mode, actually shifting it to the deity of the Sri Padmanabha temple, saying that the real king is Sovereignty would rest with Sri Padmanabha and he was only a servant. And you know something, there is actually a little Vakkal, where he, so this is the same thing, it's very modern bureaucratic move, where he actually signs away his kingdom to the kingdom to Sri Padmanabha and accepts his prime ministership. Very smart, uh, modern, and so modern in India will actually be the 18th century. We should, we should start doing things in that way. So, anyway, so this was not a face, remember, this was not a face by the British. But who challenged it? Anybody? But there was a challenge. The 19th century was a huge challenge. And that challenge actually came from you. It came from the Ayyavarika Swami cult, you know, the Ayyavari cult, which, which uh, challenged the authority of the Travel Court King, called him Ananda Puri Nietzsche. Uh, um, you know, the evil the evil force of another Puri. Uh, and, um, uh, and of course the Chana, uh, the Chana women, the other group which challenged him were the Chana women, not men, Ganga, but the Chana women who fought for the upper class. They were, remember, they were, not, they were not really asking for the blouse because they were modest and nice ladies who wanted to be, you know, cover themselves and be in the corner. Rather, they were, they wanted, they basically wanted the blouse, yes, but they all, because they were good Christians, maybe, but they wanted above all the upper, the upper floor, which would be, which would make them equal in social terms with ours. So that, these are the two important challenges and very severe challenges that the, the Travancore monarchy suffered, uh, faced in the early 20th century. And how did it manage, to, how did it try to uh, refurbish its own power, its damaged social sovereignty? It tried to turn itself into a modern state or a modern state. In fact, Travancore projected itself as the modern state of British India. Uh, and by extending modern governmental power. So you can by mid in 19th century, you can see that the travel for monarchy is moving in the direction of freeing up property rights, uh, encouraging modern enterprise, extending education and healthcare, even opening up public spaces, that is public 
then set up there any any citizen could go, any subject, respective of caste. And therefore, public facilities had to be located far away from major capitals. Not try doing that kind of an exercise. Please go to every town in Bangalore. This is a good, good exercise, good kind of project that the students here could do. Go and look at the location of state facilities in in Travancore Kochan and see where they are located. Also try and compare it for Manabar because Manabar has a very different tragic you know. Might be good. But then what we know is from Norman, from Norman orders is that it should not be here any visitor. Why? Because the Travancore monarchy is also the guardian of the past. Jenma the order of past. Anyway, so um, and the long and short of it is that the sovereignty of Travancore and anchored in the Sri Padmanabha, uh, Sri Padmanabha was not, and the preservation of the caste order was not eradicated. Rather, it was it continued in a tempered form by new governmental power of the Travancore state as British colonialism extended. Now, in this model, the abjected caste were offered a limited visibility in the eyes of the state, so they could, uh, you know, attend the schools set up by missionaries and so on. The modern schools and hospitals open to them without disturbing the disadvantage, the advantages enjoyed by the caste. So it's interesting that when the missionary schools spread and more lower caste people uh, study, young students went to these schools, the the privileged class in Kerala were very weak in traffic were were very worried that they will not get government jobs without modern education. So it was their complaints that actually set, led to the setting up of government schools in Kerala. And that is why government schools in Kerala, at least till very recent times, were dominated by our class, at least till the 1960s. Now, however, being a Hindu state that antedated colonialism, uh, Travancore and Pochi Pochi also possessed the authority to, uh, to introduce the reforms that affected skin allowances and resource distribution among the higher caste groups, unlike in the British case. Now, when Britishers tried to change marriage and family laws and tried to, for example, protect children, you know, to uh, raising the age of marriage, etc., there was a storm. The upper caste in Bengal raised storm against them. In Kerala, that would be Travis, Kerala in general and Travancore Kochi in particular would not be issued because the sovereign power of regulating caste was anyway with the state. So um, uh, uh, so it's never really but never really um, settling down its responsibility to protect the caste order these native states became amenable to the pressure of newly educated sections of upper caste people to reform marriage, inherited family, and so on. And so, you know, this was because uh, the, I mean, there's a lot of literature on the kind of pressure behind social reform, mostly on the lines of Victorian neo brahminical Indian family. You know, that's what all the social reformers talked about, especially the elite social reformers talked about. Based on patrilineal succession and comfort, compulsory heterosexuality, and the idea of sexual complementarity. Now, the educated new elite, which sought to reform their caste into modern communities, swore by the disciplinary power uh, of the woman as the chief instrument of shaping subject adequate to it. So, this is, I mean, I've written reams and reams on this already, so I'm not going to go a lot into that. Uh, so, but what I did not write at that point was about the deployment, a different implicit deployment of sovereign power within the projected modern community and which rested on the power of the father, mother and patriarchal community leader, leadership. So this was through shared claims of, uh, you know, claims of shared blood on common historical origin. So if you look at the writing in the early uh, 20th century on by, by the leaders and the um, votaries of modern caste community organizations, you will see that they are all talking about how this caste had an ancient origin. They were like wonderful in the past and then they all declined or they came from somewhere and then they declined and uh, so on. And so this is, this is the ending 
know that these cars were actually a whole bunch of fragmented uh, groups, which were which had were kind of linked together by very specific kinds of crimes. Now it was these basically community, modern community formation in Kerala aimed at bringing together all these fragments and creating modern communities from them. And this ancient past, this game regarding the ancient past, or a shared, uh, you know, a shared journey across time, all common blood led to the firming up of endogamy. So the modern communities in Kerala together are fanatically endogamous. You can marry only within your community of birth. So we are so bloody modern. How come we are so obsessed with marrying in our past? Now that is where the deployment of sovereign power is available. So modern families of the of particular new elite caste communities were not just disciplinary institutions, they were also the carriers of pure blood across the generations, pure blood in you know, scare words. Uh, uh, endogamy became central to eat almost all languages of progressive social change from the missionaries to community reformers were agreed that the sovereign power in the new form, family that is, the refurbished authority of the father was necessary and that it was the indisputable, if invisible, grounds of the on family. And in turn, the exercise of disciplinary power based on this formation. Don't remember that if the mother is allowed to be the gentle disciplinarian in, in a family, she must first accept the implicit sovereign power of the father. Only then she can claim that power. As based on foundation, was agreed to be crucial to entrenching the state's governmental power over individual persons. So if you look at, uh, you know, the Divan Madhavarao's uh, very interesting book uh, from the late 19th century called Bala Pyasana uh, uh, I mean, the English title is different. Uh, the Malayalam translation is Bala Pyasana Tepati. Where he's teaching Malayalis to raise children, how to raise good, productive, industrious children. He very clearly said, first there has to be a father who's like a stable ground who will control things, but not with violence, like it is in traditional families. In traditional families, the Karnava is a pure character. The oldest male is, um, terrifies everybody else into submission. Unlike that, this father has to stay in the background. He must exercise power, but it must be very gentle. Very, very, it must be strong, but not poison. Later, this power of, ex, of, of exercising gentle power is granted to educated, what are educated women. So, of course, the, so what happens is because British laws, uh, uh, kind of because the power of life and death, of course, is central to any political sovereignty. So, because the British were political sovereigns, no more could uh, caste sovereignty kill, you know, really kill. So, they would kill. Uh, in a, in a, what should I say, outside the law, but technically in terms of colonial law, killing someone because they had broken a caste boundary, etc., was not allowed. That was a crime, technically. In practice, in real terms, this could happen, and then, of course, like it happens now, it can be covered up in so many different ways. And, of course, because all these uh, officials, etc., were very much part of the caste hierarchy, they would pollute cover up those crimes. So that's another matter, but technically speaking, this was a crime. So, uh, you, so you, you know, so hypogamous, for example, hypogamous exogamy, that is marrying someone who was lower, or a woman, marrying someone who was lower in social status, uh, would result in death, sure death, in earlier times. But now, there would be no death, but definitely social, modern uh, communities would cause who could lead the woman into social ostracism and, uh, she, and, and of course uh, denial of inheritance and so on. So new notions of possible kin, you know, from the woman's uh, devotion of chastity come to pour in this period. So you know, for example, this idea of first night never existed in Kerala, except among the Brahmins, uh, they had a, um, the, 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 
there's a, there's a particular name, Shanti Mukhuta, for the consummation of uh, the veil. Uh, but that was limited to the Brahmins. But otherwise, the idea of first time was, it, could be, it was an act that could be performed by Brahmins or by God or whatever. And anyway, it didn't matter at all. But now that changes, the woman's body becomes, uh, you know, a, a particular kind of resource that is transferred to the husband's family and, and it is acted upon, your, your, your body is acted upon by sovereign body of blood. So in Kerala, um, uh, the average age of female sterilization now is around 26, 27. Hmm? Imagine at the age of 26, 27, you have two babies and your children are apart. Hmm? Now, if you want to have a child with another man, it's going to be because it's very difficult to prepare the vegetarian. Vasectomy is very simple and can be reversed very easily. But in Canada, every year you have lakhs of cubectomy, but hundreds of vasectomy. So what does that mean? That means that your body, if you are to marry, is passed on to, and it comes under, whether you know it or not, it comes under the sovereign authority of another man and his family. It is meant to reproduce his genetic pool, his blood. We say genetic pool, but at that point it's pure blood. Mm -hmm. um, and so the possibility of you of having another partner and maybe wanting to have a child with another partner is that what? Not something I said, is it? You might get ostracized if you try any of that, even now. So, um, yeah. Um, so then this is control over, and this also means control over the woman's property. So then, uh, during, uh, after the night, then uh, the Mediterranean family is divided. Most of the property, the women of course inherited, got their share. All of it was, it was understood that then we control that share of property. So, so you see, sovereign power is very much alive. It may not be talking big. It's not like the old times when, um, you know, you've heard stories and Ambodhari families where the, the, the calcitrant woman was killed with a single blow of a kidney and thrown into some bushes or murdered, you know, or murdered because she fell in love with the fear and all these stories we have heard of. So this is like, um, uh, you might do that because on the British, uh, there, there might be consequences. And in the 20th century, definitely, you know, with more democratization, lower caste people asserting themselves to greater democratization, this might actually become a serious uh, issue. So you don't have killings anymore. I mean, I mean less than number of killings. You don't know actually how many killings happen. You don't know, but anyway, not many reported, at least of this time. Less than number of reported, at least. Uh, and uh, instead, you have the father as the implicit power holder, sovereign power holder in the family, who will break, who will come into the fore only when some breach happens. And then the sovereign power of maybe expunging the family and including expelling the, uh, a woman who does not, you know, who seems to be not able to, um, you know, keep the blood going. All that happens. So, um, yeah. And, and remember, endogamy was actively fought for. So, Nambudri reform movement, which we all idealize as some, I hope they don't do it anymore. And when I was a student, they were still idealizing. So, I have a whole damn chapter on it. So I should have, I mean, I feel um, deprived because I don't know why I. Uh, now, when I think back of it, a lot of young people are asking, why did you pay so much attention to a Nambudri reform movement? Nambudri is hardly like 3 to 4% of the Malayali population. So, why did you think? I said, no, this Mahmoudi reform movement is sitting on my head. Like, they could be telling all of us that it was the ideal reform movement, so I went to take it apart. So I had to devote a whole chapter of that thesis. Anyway, so what, that is a moment where they fought for endogamy. They, they wanted endogamy, they wanted to end their existing um, exogamous practices and bring in endogamy. So, um, yeah. So the modern woman's mind was to be developed as a resource for the everyday disciplining of modern families. And, and uh, you know, the, um, the repeated stress on training women to accept both the role of the gentle disciplinarian and her subversive subservience to the police of the refurbished sovereign part is actually quite evident. If you really read the, the famous novels of the late 19th century, 
the eponymous heroines, you know, in Viveka or Vasubadi, they are not just claiming for themselves the space of the agent, the discipline of the agent. They are also saying that, promising to stay within the bounds of sovereignty. So, you know, Indulega is saying that she, her, she will not fall in love with any man who she cannot have. And what determines who she can have? Definitely this task. And uh, uh, also modern women writing at that point, many of the women who I actually, whose work I have uh, put up on a site called Father Vivadani, they are actually claiming to be the agents of this non-power, the disciplinary power, central to both community, but they are also saying that they don't want liberal freedoms. They don't want to be walking in parks or dancing on the good things that we badly want to in our generation. They don't want uh, the freedom to choose uh, their partners. They don't want freedom to uh, to be choose their partners in the sense that put them out in go beyond the boundaries of the caste. They don't want to be um, eating in public places. So many things they don't want. They only want to be disciplined, sovereign, so disciplined. So this new sovereign power that inherent in modern community was bolstered by. Patriarch, so you think about it, what, what, what gets this community going? So you have a patriarchal power over women's life decisions, as I told you. That is negative in nature and preventing exogamy. And what is the other side of it? The other side is the economic incentives to men as dowry. So which is positive in nature and preventing exogamy by men. So men find it more advantage is advantage is to marry into the community because the prospect of dowry is there. To marry outside the community means that you might lose that opportunity. Now so by sacrificing liberal freedom, ceding their bodies to the family and community and becoming the agent of government power, this is a new kulina. This is a new kulina that is in the Sanskritic typology you have basically kulina, kritya and vesya. That's how women are divided. Vesha doesn't mean modern prostitute. It means the desert of culture, the woman who, who, who provides his pleasure to the upper class male. That's the Kulina, the new Kulina, therefore is like the an agent of government in power and she, she keeps within the, the boundaries drawn by sovereign power in community and family. And uh, she could take, claim a place, however the secondary, within the community, share the gains and the powers of her new age community. That's really the, the, uh, what she gains from it. And such a family, and remember, this, is, this family is an interesting family, this modern family, it bore a very heavy new responsibility of supporting itself through enterprise and gainful labor. So the state and community might offer support, but ultimately the welfare of an individual is assumed to be their family's responsibility. And in Kerala, from the mid uh, century onwards, there is no hope, if you will notice, to democratize the family even indirectly, the new age family. So all social reform comes to by the 1950s. Why? Have you thought why? It's because of this, because you have this form just crystallized. And I even claim that there is an implicit social contract in Kerala between patriarchal authorities of the new elite communities and the state about women's socially acceptable roles, I mean public roles. So you find that no, there are no efforts to extend liberal freedom. And even in work, you know, when women are, the kind of work women can do is shaped by these concepts. Have you ever wondered why nurses in Kerala where and are treated so badly? Because nursing, as you know, is an important profession. It is very central to our claims of being, you know, a healthcare provider to the masses, etc. And it never already very central in the 1950s. How come the state never bothered to improve their service conditions, pay them better, try to fight the stigma? Why? Now, I would say that this is evidence that there is an implicit fact between the state, uh, the modernizing state, and the communities, the big communities, the elite communities in Kerala. Because why? Nursing is a profession that requires a woman to cross community boundaries on a daily basis. 
and compromise her bodily purity by touching the body of strangers. And she has to travel every day that distance as it from home. It's a daily thing. So it is, there is a way in which this, this has to be made happy because that's what so what Malayali nurses do, they were very smart. They started running away in the 1950s. They went abroad. So don't, Malayali women do not go. So that's another matter. And the post independent in so you would both in post-independence, if you look at it, in fact, this is recorded in the work of social scientists. Uh, the new elite women steadily lose property. You know, so the property owned by women in Kerala is actually much less, you know, even if you compare it with other many other places. Uh, where yes, uh, many other places is supposed to be less socially developed. Now, and, and you actually see, in fact, what happens in the, in fact, the end of the 20th century is a big break. That is, in the mid 1950s, 1980s, higher education institutions begin to spread all over Kerala. And this leads to a large number of young women entering college. Now, that's the single most revolutionary thing. Very silently, it happened in in the 1980s and after. Now this is, you know, so what? So you had the 1990s came, liberalization, globalization, and media explosion, the chance for young women to go and study outside Kerala. Now a lot of different things just opened all at once. No wonder they were all worried about what will happen to the family, etc. But uh, you know what happens is this is happening. So you have young women who are individuated who are making their mark in almost every field, but very little employment. Now, a basic condition for any feminist revolution anywhere in the world is that women enter the labor market in large numbers. That's not happening. So what we have is an atmosphere that is like bursting with gender tension. Women, at the, the age of the angry young woman is upon us. And these women are questioning everything. But the, where the fall that they need, the material support that they need to break free, is almost non-existent. So that is really the crisis, and that that is really the crisis of the modern family. And after after the new millennium, you have more and more Muslim young men, uh, Dalit young men, uh, in colleges, in public spaces, interacting with more and more women of all kinds of communities. And one of the important reasons why suddenly love did not pop up in 2007. You don't have to search a lot for that. So the crisis of modern family in these privileged communities is essentially the crisis of patriarchal power in it. So I'm, I'm just being facing it. Now, I told you, this is only half the story. The other half is about the uh, uh, the coming of the family as an institution among Kerala's oppressed caste communities. So uh, in court, you know that the, the proposition of such a family was offered to them essentially by the missionary in the 19th century. That's when it happened first. Uh, and however, these were communities which were denied resources or even people like Ayangar fought very hard in the traffic court state council. Uh, the resource, actual material resources that he could secure were not great, and whatever was secured was also later, uh, you know, taken away by higher officials, etc. So um, these communities were denied resources, and so modern community formation was not really prolific among them. It was much present, definitely, a number of efforts, but it did not really, you know, become these groups that are grew into powerful groups, powerful blocks. Like the like the Iravas or the Mayas. The Iravas, of course, are an exception and they should be discussed separately. But the Mayas or the Mahmudris or the Syrian Christians, etc., or the, the, the elite Muslims, etc., they had a, a different tragic draw together of having a lot of resources with which to build communities and the new family and so on. So, uh, and in fact, it's not at all easy to uh, direct the oppressed class women into domestic confinement and modern wifehood or motherhood uh, because you know modern wifehood and motherhood involves staying at home and not really uh, making an income. Basically looking after, thinking of offering care work, doing for care work, unpaid care work. Now it was not easy for women of the oppressed communities to do this because in labor it was a while. So then sociologists also noted, despite the fact that 
uh, the discourse of the modern family actually proliferated quite a bit through in the oppressed communities, through the oppressed class communities, through their social reform. Actualization of such a family was actually quite delayed, and this is confirmed not only by the sociologists who were researching the, uh, the, uh, the oppressed class family in the 1960s, but like Sharada Mani and many others, George, C.K. John, and others, but also by uh, historians like Anna Lindbergh, who looked at, who actually studied the family in the among the cashew workers of Canada in the 1950s onwards. So there are no assets, nothing to give us dowry. So the extent to which the modern family rested on the on the availability of assets, that means that's quite evident because these are not family entirely assets. They were mobilized as agricultural and industrial workers from the 1930s by the left in Kerala by the communists. And the communists also highlighted the sexual oppression of women workers by AIDS, which was a key theme in their politics. And this was part of the remaining caste order by which any oppressed class woman could be turned into a sexual chattel. And this was contested and challenged by the communists and was one of the great victories in Kerala. But this did not actually move towards anything other than conjugal war. So this woman was rescued from the elite, from the uh, sexual oppression of human elites, was to be moved into a conjugal marital arrangement. Now, women workers also now. Remember, these were all women workers. They were actually in Kerala in all the traditional industries in agriculture. The vast number of workers, vast majority of workers were female. But they did not possess any public, strong public identities as Lindbergh so clearly shows. They were rarely in leadership, not just Lindbergh, but also people like Mira Lindbergh who studied the mobilization of women in the 1930s and 40s. Who say this? They are very in leadership, represented mostly as women and their children, or mothers and children. In the photographs of the massive militant uh, cashew worker strikes of the 1950s, it's actually the women who are fights who are striking, but they don't have treasures, etc., so they carry the kids or their kids and so on. So they are immediately identified as mothers and children. And uh, again, in the 1930s, governmental care towards workers. That is through the Travel Code Party Act, etc., which is supposed to be for the welfare of the working class, effectively effeminized these women by identifying them as mothers responsible for the family rather than workers in their own right. So the Travel Code Party Act 1979 prohibited women from working long hours and night shifts to give them, I quote, sufficient time to attend domestic duties, not for rest. Not, for, not even for safety. It's for basically doing housework. Uh, a whole set of wage fixation committees from the 1940s to the 80s reduced wages for women workers, so all women, women were identified as deserving only a lesser wage because they were supposed to be secondary workers. While the men, their husbands, were supposed to be primary male breadwinners. So they were supposed to get an additional component to their wage the family wage, which made them get a viable. You will find that across the traditional industry. So you tell me, why should a woman, and these are these workplaces, agree that the left is do a lot to democratize these workplaces. But the labor was extremely heavy, the exploitation levels were very high, um, the feudal harassment had gone away, but it was not, had not disappeared. Uh, neither were the I, uh, the leaders of the left completely free of uh, feudal ideas of what a woman is obliged to do for their lower caste woman is obliged to do for them, etc. So why should any woman want to steal? So the second generation, the first generation of these women who gained all these benefits chose to marry off their daughters with dowry to fellows who don't drink. That's, that was the bottom line. They wanted husbands who would take care of their wives. So staying at home seemed like a better option. And being a non-working housewife protected by the, the, a steady earner, the husband who would actually earn some good money as male breadwinner, you know, uh, that seemed like a better option than slaving away in a factory where you still kind of, your blood is basically drawn out for some uh, capitalism there to make a profit. profit. So that was the logic of these women. 
So, um, now, and, now, so then by the 1980s, you actually see a huge fall in this, in, in, I mean, opportunities, that's why it's an opportunity to see women work because our agricultural sector contracted after 1975. Traditional industries like oil, cashew, etc. began the down collapse, which is at a peak now. The collapse is at a, has really reached a, a nadir now. So uh, uh, that happened, and that starts in the 1980s with women being thrown out of work. Tile factory slowly. For example, in Kerala, in, in Kolla, my hometown, at that time, and I was in Kolla, I remember, cashew factories were in crisis. So a lot of women were carrying cashew work, etc. Some of them would come to town and work part time as domestic workers. So they moved into informal sector work. Tile factories were closing, so all the women who worked in the tile factories were out looking for domestic work. So entering into domestic work, informalized, low pay, low skill, stigmatized work, I call the new Bhritya. So this is modern caste. This is caste, Ramanika patriarchy, the modern, modern patriarchy created the, the new Kulina in the 1930s and 40s. It created the new Bhritya in the 1980s. And um, see, and also don't imagine. So the women workers were confined to home, okay, they, they decided to give up work and stay at home and be taken care of the husband, etc. This did, that did not bring them the social prestige of the Kulina. Rather, there were bodies to be acted upon by the governmental power of the state, especially family planning. So this seems to answer the question. Now, now there is one big puzzle in family planning studies in Kerala is that how is it that until 1975, you had men coming forward for vasectomy in large numbers. So the, the people who, who agreed to do family planning were all men. They came forward for vasectomy. After the uh, mid-1970s, you see a huge reverse trend. That is, men don't come. And one important reason for that is the terror unleashed by the emergency where a lot of men were forcibly sterilized. So that terror is an important thing. Secondly, the technology of uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, family planning also changes and the focus becomes all more on women than on men. Again, these two factors notwithstanding, I would still argue that this is a time when women are beginning to be thrown out of the labor market in Kerala from traditional industry. <coughs> and, and this is probably an effect of this feminization as well. So, women's bodies are no, no longer perceived as laboring for an income outside. So, you can, male bodies are supposed to be liberating. So, remember all this talk about how uh, family planning can, can actually reduce your energy, your energy to labor, and such people. Here's the rampant in Kerala in the 1970s. So, if the woman not working anymore, she might as well undergo that rather than the man who has to go and engage in hard physical labor every day. So it would be an effect of that feminization. And the asset-less workers became and, and also became asset poor families in the 1970s uh, when with the land reform. So title deeds were given mostly to men, 10 cents of land were given to the working class poor and all the title deeds were in male names. And so now working class men were promoted to the lowest ranks of the bourgeois property on And women became their dependents. So this logic you can see follows, follows through even the agricultural traditions, given starting in the 1980s. So Leela Gulati's important work on uh, agricultural work as mentioned shows that male workers were more likely to get their pensions. That be identical. Though, as I told you, women workers were a huge majority of agricultural labor. Anyway, so not so. And then uh, you can see the 1980s. So there's a real crisis because the women are out of work. The men are still protected, uh, but the women are out of work and they are struggling. Now, in the 1990s, you have a very, very context, perfect context to widen inequality. And the reason for that is that the religion is from the bulk. Now flow into Kerala hugely. Liberalization, one of the one of the effects of liberalization was that people who were abroad, working abroad, would send large quantities of money to Kerala. So, uh, uh, so you can see that wages were high in Kerala, they still 
high in Kerala. But they just remember the depreciated value. But the uh, uh, families which, which had members working in the garden who could send money here were able to acquire assets, the value of which depreciated less. So, for now, and again, for a movie, man, we do make it. But they were not that kind of idea. But she, I'm not going to say poorly. But what is poorly? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But she, our boss is going to say that they were not that kind of idea. So, you see, that is how the social inequality is actually violent in Kerala. So, in this context, you see, and also, Kerala became a highly migrant, migration dependent society. So, the whole aim of social product, reproduction changed. So, if in the 1980s, 1980s or 1970s, the aim of social reproduction was still to produce labor power for the local capitalism. Now, the aim of social reproduction became producing labor for global stock markets, which is far more expensive, it requires a great more effective labor on the part of women. Women have to focus on children, make sure that they go to tuition, make sure that they don't have a mental breakdown, you know, make, you know, watch every little bit of their time so that they get into entrance to the and into exams. They get into technical education, etc., etc. So, the very nature of social reproduction changes, and this becomes a huge challenge for the less privileged families. Also, in the 1990s, education and healthcare both get out of the social, as moved by the government from the social sector to the commercial sector, which means that all of the costs of much self-financing education is very expensive, not affordable to the poor. Remember, this coincides with the coming of the Kurumashri, with cheap credit. So, cheap Kurumashri offers cheap credit to the poor. Now, without Kurumashri, there would have been a social collapse at that point. Now, I'm not saying Kurumashri is great for that reason. I'm just saying, historically, it kind of shows up the family, the poor family, at a point when it would have actually collapsed. Under the fact, because men, men's employment, the employment uh, of men also began to dwindle in the late 1990s when groups, when you know, uh, groups of workers from other states are coming here, are being, are being brought here for you know, for the kind of labor that minority men are they're not willing to do anymore. So you can see that uh, even men, the, the family wage earning regular earner is disappearing. And that, even that, so the responsibility of even finding an income begins to fall on the woman all the more. And Kurumashi is the perfect solution. You don't have to get out of the house. Essentially, you don't have to go and become a remaining worker. You can stay in the house. You can be another a government rights for leader. And, you know, that's, that's how the low middle class, working class family is kind of held up. So, um, yeah, so um, I'm going to stop here. I've been like, talking on and going on and on. So, in conclusion, I'm trying to argue that the crisis of the family in these two different groups of people, the privileged uh, elite on the one hand and the caste of this uh, working class, uh, is very difficult. So, in, among the poor, the crisis is definitely of. of of, of an economic nature. So, debt is a terrible, terrible burden. So, debt in among the, uh, in, and I have some feedback on, 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 on this. So, and, and the way the, the huge weight of the debt is borne, essentially, by, and we being lovely middle class young ladies, in our all happy in our feminist clubs, we don't really look at what is happening to the working class women. We really don't. We really don't care that they are drowning 